help stoke the rage will be held accountable, even as arrests of the insurrectionists themselves mount. On today's show, three weeks to the day since the attack on the Capitol, we'll break down for you what happened, how it happened, and who was behind it. A story of rage, conspiracy, and violence. We begin on election night. In fact, the early hours of November the 4th, with millions of votes left to count, no network has called a race yet. But Fox News has called Arizona for Joe Biden. And as the numbers roll in, it looks like Donald Trump might be heading for defeat in the key swing states. But that doesn't stop the then president coming out to prematurely and falsely declare victory. This is a major fraud in our nation. We will win this, and we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. So I just want to thank you. We are uh, and reluctant to step in, but duty-bound to point out when he says we did win this election, we've already won. Uh, that is not based in the facts at all. Uh, again, uh, there are millions of votes yet to be counted. Our presidents don't select our victors. Despite that real-time fact-check in the early hours, the campaign to overturn the election begins. Later that day, Trump supporters start showing up in their droves at Stop the Steal rallies across the nation, protesting the still incomplete results as votes are counted. In Arizona, armed protesters are outside the Maricopa County election headquarters, and in the crowd, a major Trump ally, right-wing Congressman Paul Gosar. In Philadelphia, police arrest two armed men heading to the city's voting center. They have QAnon paraphernalia on their car. These Stop the Steal protests spurred by baseless claims from Trump and top Republicans, as well as right-wing cable news, continue all week. Facebook is where these dangerous conspiracy theories spread fastest, and the company only belatedly acts under pressure to remove the Stop the Steal group from its platform, citing worrying calls for violence from some members. Two days later, it's November the 7th, and we have a winner. Okay. We have an announcement to make. Joe Biden is president-elect of the United States. Trump's legal team escalates what will become a months-long, lie-filled series of court battles to try and overturn the result and disenfranchise millions of voters. Obviously, he's not, he's not going to concede when at least 600,000 ballots are in question. We are on the precipice of, this is essentially a new American revolution. And anybody who wants this country to remain free needs to step up right now, and I'm going to release the Kraken. Come mid-November, all eyes turn to Georgia, where Trump demands a hand count of the ballots. It's now the third count of the votes there after a tight Biden win triggered an automatic recount. And the pressure Trump and his allies pour on Brad Raffensperger and Gabriel Sterling, the state's two top Republican election officials, is fierce. Senator Lindsey Graham personally calls Raffensperger, questioning the legitimacy of the ballots. The Georgia Secretary of State repeatedly rebuffs the baseless accusations of widespread voter fraud. Now, he and his wife begin getting death threats, all because he's doing his job. Gabriel Sterling, fed up, takes to the podium in the Georgia Capitol. It looks like you likely lost the state of Georgia. We're investigating, there's always a possibility, I get it, and you have the rights to go through the courts. What you don't have the ability to do, and you need to step up and say this, is stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's gonna get hurt, someone's gonna get shot, someone's gonna get killed. Of course, it doesn't stop there. Trump's allies keep up the rigged election line, not just in Georgia, but across the country, and the rhetoric is intensifying. We are the rock. The people are the rock, and we're going to slay Goliath, the communists, the liberals, the phonies. Joe Biden will never set foot in the Oval Office of this country. It will not happen on our watch. Never going to happen. Within the swing states, if he wanted to, he could take military capabilities and he could place them in those states and basically rerun an election in each of those states. I mean, it's not unprecedented. I mean, these people out there talking about martial law, it's like it's something that we've never done. We've done, the martial law has been instituted 64, 64 times. 
At this point, Trump has now lost over 50 election lawsuits after providing no evidence of fraud. Even Attorney General Bill Barr, a fierce Trump ally, says he's found no evidence of widespread fraud. Trump announces the AG's resignation on December the 14th, the same day the states certify their votes and Biden's win. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Trump is doing everything he can to get the election to go his way, despite losing many times over at this point. The day after Barr's resignation announcement, Trump calls in his deputy, Jeffrey Rosen. The president tries to pressure him into filing briefs in the legal efforts to overturn the election and to appoint a special counsel to investigate unfounded claims of voter fraud. When Rosen refuses to play ball, Trump turns to another DOJ lawyer, Jeffrey Clark, who supports the president's efforts. Their plotting begins. At the same time, we're getting more hints at what's to come. On December the 19th, Trump tweets, big protest in DC on January the 6th. Be there, will be wild. That Arizona congressman I mentioned earlier, Paul Gosar, he's been spending his time at Stop the Steal rallies, often with a far-right activist named Ali Alexander. In a series of videos, Alexander claims that Gosar is helping him organize a January 6th rally at the Capitol, along with Republican congressman Andy Biggs and Mo Brooks. Alexander, however, offers no proof of this. Biggs and Brooks will eventually deny the claims while Gosar gives no comment. But at a December 19th rally, Gosar reportedly told the crowd, you get to go back home once we conquer the hill. Donald Trump is returned to being president. But it's not just these fringe House GOP figures who are conspiratorially pointing to the importance of the January the 6th date and Congress's official counting of the vote that day. On the Saturday before, Senator Ted Cruz gets pretty worked up in Georgia. And we will not go quietly into the night. And Trump's behind-the-scenes efforts are still going on. Also on that Saturday, in a last-ditch effort, he calls up Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and again puts the pressure on. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have, because we won the state, and flipping the state is a great testament to our country. A day later, now acting A.G. Rosen re-enters the picture, because that DOJ lawyer, Jeffrey Clark, he's just told Rosen that Trump plans to fire him and install Clark in his place. Rosen makes his case to Trump and convinces him that it would lead to an even bigger scandal with DOJ officials promising to quit en masse. Rosen leaves the White House with his job intact and Trump is running out of time. It's now the Monday before January the 6th and top Trump ally Senator Josh Hawley goes on Fox to say this. Are you trying to say that as of January 20th, that President Trump will be president? Well, Brad, that, did, that depends on what happens on Wednesday. So there's Hawley, there's Cruz, and we know that several House Republicans are planning to object to Biden's win when Congress convenes on Wednesday the 6th. And on January the 5th, the day before, some House Democrats are surprised to see their Republican colleagues give what one of them later calls a reconnaissance tour of the Capitol. And so here we are, the morning of January the 6th. Thousands of Trump supporters, many of whom are veterans of Stop the Steal rallies in places like Arizona and Georgia, converge on Washington, D.C. As far as everyone is concerned, Congress will convene, some Republicans will object, those objections will go nowhere, and lawmakers will put their official stamp on Joe Biden as president-elect. But to maybe misquote Ted Cruz, Trump and co. are not going quietly into the morning. Let's have trial by combat. Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. Pretty violent rhetoric in front of a pretty angry crowd. And Trump himself continues to pour gasoline on the fire, suggesting that he's making one last stand and calling on his supporters to take action. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. 
Joining me now to talk more about all of this, the lead up to the horrific events of the 6th of January, are Ryan Grimm, DC Bureau Chief for The Intercept, and my NBC colleague, Ben Collins, who covers disinformation. Uh, Ryan, let me start with you. I know you've reported on this extensively, but how clear are the ties, in your view, between Donald Trump in Congress and the Stop the Steal rallies in states like Arizona and Georgia in the run-up to January the 6th? Well, they're, they're intricately linked. Uh, Trump uh, was the, you know, the effective kind of spiritual leader of all of these rallies. You know, he, was, he was encouraging them at all of these events. People would say, you know, the, the president is watching this right now. Uh, you know, don't let the president down. You know, he's, he's counting on us. Uh, Paul Gosar, you know, who's who spoke at uh, several of these events, Jim Jordan, who traveled to you know different states to speak at these uh, different events, were kind of channeling through him. As 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 you said, uh, Andy Biggs, who's the chair of the uh, Freedom Caucus, sent a video to to one of these uh, one of these rallies and has said that, well, I sent that through Gosar. Well, w what I've also uncovered is that his wife was also. Biggs's wife was also at that rally where he also sent a video and his wife spoke at a a, a similar rally about a, a week and a half before that one in Arizona. So, you know, as much as folks are trying to kind of scur scurry away from this, this was a, a, a very networked uh, movement, you know, that connected in a way that Democrats would never try to do, that connected the fringes of the conservative movement with the fringes of yep. the House Republican Caucus, with then the leadership of that fringe, which is the, the Freedom Caucus, with then the White House, which is, you know, d Democrats won't show up at the same uh, in the same city as, as Antifa, for instance. Uh, but this, on the other hand, was, <laughs> was all kind of a hand in glove. So you mentioned the fringe. You've reported also on this far right activist, Ali Alexander, uh, as we have on this show as well, who was involved in organizing the January the 6th rally at which Trump spoke, Giuliani spoke, as we just saw. He claims he organized it with help from three Republican congressmen, Paul Gosar, uh, Mo Brooks and Andy Biggs. Uh, Alexander made those claims in multiple Periscope videos, including this archived video first provided to you in The Intercept and then to us by Jason Palladino, an investigative reporter for the independent watchdog uh, project on government oversight. Have a listen. I was the person who came up with the January 6th idea with Congressman Gosar, Congressman Mo Brooks and then Congressman Andy Biggs. We four schemed up of putting maximum pressure on Congress while they were voting so that who we couldn't lobby, we could change the hearts and the minds of Republicans who were in that body hearing our loud war from outside. Ryan, Ali Alexander hasn't offered public proof of the congressman's involvement, nor has he stated they plan to breach the Capitol. We've tried reaching him. Do you think these pretty sensational claims will be part of the four House committees who are now investigating, launched investigations uh, into the attack on the Capitol? The, the claims uh, certainly will be investigated, as I understand it already, uh, are, are being investigated. And it's, and it's not as if there's no circumstantial evidence to, to back them up. At, at one of the rallies that Ali Alexander uh, host, sponsored, hosted, spoke at, emceed at, you know, in, in Arizona, Paul Gosar also spoke there. Uh, he introduced Gosar at a separate kind of stop the steal rally in the state. At that same rally, like I said, uh, Biggs sent a video of himself saying, you know, I'm in Washington conti continuing up this fight, yeah. fight and I'm in Washington with my ally, ally Mo Brooks. Uh, you know, so it was Biggs that mentioned uh, Mo, Mo Brooks. And like I said, uh, Biggs' wife was at was at this uh, stop the steal and there's video yeah. of her introducing herself uh, to to Ali in a way like, hey, you know, I'm I'm Biggs' wife. It's a pleasure, pleasure to meet you. So we know we know that they knew each other. Now, Ali Alexander is the kind of person that is going to exaggerate, you know, what his relationship is with, yes. with people in power. You know, this we we all know these types of fringe actors. And so, you know, it but, it 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 may, it may just be that Gosar was kind of the the go between with with Biggs and and Brooks. But we do know for a fact that he and Gosar were working closely together. Uh, that Gosar, uh, Brooks, and and, and, and Biggs, we know working closely together. Uh, 
And we know that Mo Brooks' excuse is that, well, I went to the rally because the White House told me to, which just further ropes the right. White House into that rally and into the events of January the 6th. Uh, ben, let me bring you in. What role did social media play in getting people first to believe these nonsensical stop the steal conspiracies, then to turn up at rallies, and then to head for Washington, D.C. itself on the 6th? It was an enormous part of this. But like Ryan said, this is a lot more organized than people suggest. Um, you know, people who were close to the president over the few weeks before January 6th were ramping up the rhetoric substantially. Uh, you know, Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy, as you know, a day before the rally at three in the morning, he tweeted a uh, eight con document calling for war explicitly. Um, you know, Mike Flynn, who was in uh, the circles of Donald Trump in those weeks beforehand, uh, who had just been pardoned, he, you know, he had sworn the, the oath to QAnon and his brother, it turns out, uh, was in some sort of decision-making process during the Capitol riot uh, it, that would have allowed him to have faster gotten some help to the Capitol. Um, there's a lot we don't know about what happened. I, you know, I, I want to find out organizationally how this all worked because the people who are ramping up the rhetoric, people who are talking about war, people who are talking about yeah. arming up. For example, there was a Steve ben there was a Steve Bannon acolyte who specifically said, it's time to arm up, it's time for war. And then he was at all these Stop the Steal uh, rallies, and he was at the, at the Capitol on January 6th. You know, these people yeah. had really ratcheted up the rhetoric uh, through QAnon, and then they showed up, and then they did it. Uh, so we need to find out how close they were to the president. But, they, but ben, they, ben, they ramped up the rhetoric on platforms, not just Parler, which has become a useful whipping boy, uh, but Facebook. I mentioned the Facebook belatedness in terms of taking down the Stop the Steal pages. Could the 6th of January attack have happened? Let me ask you very bluntly, without the role played by Facebook and Twitter? No. The, it, you know, organizationally, in the megaphone that they were given, it couldn't have happened. Um, in part because, you know, the president's people, the pe people around the president, had built up these massive megaphones over the last few years, and they used it <clears throat> for culminating events. Um, that's what Facebook and Twitter are the best for. You, you point to one specific event, you build up anticipation, and you get everybody excited for what's going to happen there. You know, people were showing up to the rally saying, I don't know what's going to happen today, but the president has something in store for us, and we're going to have to yeah. wait for it. And guess what? Nothing happened. He just said, go to the Capitol. And you had all these riled up people who wanted to be armed, some of whom were, uh, who had no other choice because they thought the country was going to end if the president was no longer the president. Uh, yeah. They had no other choice but to take his directive of storming the Capitol as a last stand. Yeah. We'll have to leave it there. Ryan Grimm, Ben Collins, thank you so much for your insights and your time. When we come back, the moment angry rhetoric about voter fraud turned into a violent attack on the Capitol itself. Back in 60 seconds. As we look moment by moment at how January the 6th unfolded, we've been talking about the rhetoric that grew into a riot. Even before Donald Trump's speech was over, some of the crowd, energized and angry, were streaming from the ellipse near the White House toward the Capitol, where Vice President Mike Pence joined House Speaker Nancy Pelosi as Congress gathered for the counting of electoral votes. Over the next hour, the crowd begins to press the Capitol barricades, where Capitol Police and Metro DC Police are outnumbered 
and under-equipped to deal with a situation like this. At 1 p.m., Pelosi gavels in the congressional proceedings with Pence. Around that same time, a pipe bomb is reported found outside the Republican National Committee headquarters a block south of the Capitol. In a sweep of the area, another bomb is found at the nearby Democratic National Committee headquarters. Two bombs, as well as in a truck belonging to a Trump supporter that contains several guns and 11 Molotov cocktails. On the main steps of the Capitol, protesters are already pushing through the barricades, forcing the line of police further back toward the building. Remarkably, Donald Trump is still speaking on the ellipse. A few minutes later, he concludes his speech with another call for his supporters to march up Pennsylvania Avenue. Inside the Capitol, Republicans like Senators Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and Congresswoman Lauren Boebert are still trying to stop the Electoral College's vote from being counted and seem encouraged by the crowd outside. Madam Speaker, I have constituents outside this building right now. I promised my voters to be their voice. Rioters outside the building begin to scale the walls and the scaffolding placed outside the Capitol for the upcoming inauguration. The chief of Capitol Police on a call with DC Mayor Muriel Bowser and army officials finally asks for reinforcements from the National Guard. The request is initially denied by the Pentagon because they say of concerns over bad optics. Also on that call is Lieutenant General Charles Flynn, the brother of Michael Flynn, the ex-national security advisor who has called for Trump to declare martial law. It's now just after 2 p.m. on the 6th. The barricades on both the east and west sides of the Capitol are breached by violent rioters. A few minutes later, hundreds of rioters break into the Capitol building itself. All hell is breaking loose. More members of the mob pour into the building through broken windows and doors. At 2.13, the Senate is adjourned. Secret Service members whisk away Vice President Mike Pence and his family, along with Senator Chuck Grassley, the Senate President Pro Tem, number three in the line of presidential succession. And seconds later, at 2.14, Rioters confront Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman just outside the Senate chamber doors, which haven't yet been locked. Goodman, an Iraq War veteran, offers himself up to the angry crowd as bait, getting them to chase him away from the assembled lawmakers. The distraction gives security inside the Senate just enough time to secure the chamber doors. He sort of places himself in the door frame and pushes the, the lead uh, rioter away from, from the most immediate Senate entrance and leads them away to the other side of the chamber where they're, uh, he's got backup behind him coming through, and that's where they held them for a good period of time. So really, he may have made the difference uh, between much, much bigger catastrophe, really, uh, that day. By now, the House, too, is adjourned. Law enforcement officers make a mad dash to seal those chamber doors as the mob gathers just outside. Many rioters seem to know where to go to find the hidden offices of senior lawmakers like Jim Clyburn. At 2.17, as Secret Service moves Nancy Pelosi out, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert tweets to her half a million followers in defiance of instructions from officials, quote, the speaker has been removed from the House chambers. Some members of the mob also appear prepared for serious violence. Some carry zip-tie handcuffs and even nooses. Many are beating police with everything and anything. A Wall Street Journal investigation shows that at key moments, members of the Proud Boys, the far-right extremist group whom Trump had told to stand back and stand by, are at the forefront. They're also members of the Three Percenters Militia and 30 to 40 members of the radical Oath Keepers group who have reportedly prepared for the Capitol siege for days, ready to make citizens arrests of lawmakers for treason and election fraud. One Oath Keeper posts that he's in the Capitol on Facebook. Other members respond with advice on how to navigate inside. One responds, quote, all members are in the tunnels under Capitol. Seal them in. 
turn on gas. Senators, members of Congress, staffers, and reporters are shuttled towards elevators to a secure tunnel system built after 9-11. But that too has been breached. So they run to other secure locations. Dozens of other lawmakers and staffers must shelter in place in other offices as the mob overruns the complex. Senator Tammy Duckworth, who lost her legs in Iraq, can't make it to a secure location in time and is told by Capitol Police to just barricade herself in her office. Not all Democrats trust their GOP colleagues to have their backs. Because there were QAnon and white supremacist sympathizers and, frankly, white supremacist members of Congress um, in that extraction point, I didn't even feel safe around other members of Congress. Still, the rioters are coming. Many in the Trump-supporting crowd are chanting, Hang Mike Pence. A gallows has been assembled by some protesters outside the Capitol. At 2.24, Trump shamefully adds fuel to the fire and tweets that Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done. Congress is fully under siege. The president is tweeting through it. And even Republican lawmakers like Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin are in hiding and at their wits end. Right now, I am sheltered in place in my office because we have protesters who have stormed the Capitol, clashing with Capitol Police, forcing their way into Statuary Hall. The Vice President of the United States was just rushed off the floor of the House by Secret Service. This is Banana Republic crap. This is the cost of countenancing an effort by Congress to overturn the election and telling thousands of people that there is a legitimate shot of overturning the election today. Joining me now is photojournalist Louis Palou, who was covering the rallies and whose work has appeared in National Geographic from that historic day. The video he joins us with tonight really makes you feel immersed in what happened. Uh, Louis, thanks so much for coming on the show. We can see from the images you've captured a visual experience of what that melee was like, but describe what it was like physically to be in that throng of angry Trump supporters. Well, my, my specialty is being a frontline war photographer, and I knew I had to go outside and go right to the middle of the crowd because I needed to document what was going on. This was pretty much an assault on democracy, and it needed to be recorded. It was pretty chaotic. There were people with hammers, bats, batons. They came organized with weapons. A lot of them came with weapons, pepper spray. And uh, I, I kind of kept the low profile. I kept my press credentials hidden. And you can see a lot of symbols that I've worked and covered around from white supremacy groups and paramilitary groups in, in the crowd. So it was, it was about as dangerous as covering war in Afghanistan. Wow. And your footage, Louis, is remarkable to watch as a continuous feed because at times there are rioters saying, stop, don't go in. And then around the corner, massive crowds are streaming in unchecked. It's kind of, it's chaotic, I think it's fair to say. It's total chaos. And the irony of it all is these people were going to attack what they thought they were going to preserve. And they were, in, in some sense, they were destroying themselves. Um, at one point, I went into the building and this is the scene where they broke through a door and it was a hallway where it was Americans fighting Americans. It was a pretty sad scene. You know, I, I covered Afghanistan for five years and watched Afghans fight Afghans. And here we are in the halls of what is the beacon of democracy in the world, watching police fight people, a mob essentially, trying to overturn a democratic election. Yes, and you mentioned Afghanistan and you've covered conflict around the world. A lot of Americans will say, look, that's the developing world. That we just heard uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher say, you know, banana republic. Uh, is there this sense that, oh, it could never happen here. But actually, when you look at some of the rage and hate coming out of that mob, it can happen here. Oh, it can. I'll tell you that I have a 30 year career and I've covered wars in multiple countries. I've gotten more death threats that people really meant at me in the last two months leading up to January 6th in my, January 6th in my whole career. Now, you know, what a lot of people don't talk about is the, 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 the Make America Great Again rally in November, and then the one in December, the violence was escalating, and then there was that attack in Nashville. Unrelated, but it started pointing to this rising sense of violence 
and what people were willing to do. Impossible lone wolf. Myself and my colleagues knew something was going to happen that day, something violent. We were predicting it, and we were really afraid of what was going to happen. We didn't know it was going to be the attack on the Capitol, but we really thought something really bad was going to happen, and, and this is what resulted. Uh, over the course of this show, we've been tracing the lead up to this attack and on the day itself and in the weeks leading up to it. You mentioned the weeks leading up to it and the rallies. On the day itself, was there a particular moment, a particular point of time where you thought this has gone beyond a protest? This has gone beyond even a riot. This is something totally different. Was there a particular moment where that dawned on you? Well, I think it was a slow build. You know, as you would know, as a journalist, you kind of kind of see things coming, especially for safety. And when I was at the Olympics, it felt like some of those documentaries I saw of early 30s by Mark Germany, you know, with the rise of white extremist group, the, the, the zealot, the anger, the, the energy that they're putting into this was the kind of crowd that doesn't believe in science, wasn't wearing masks, and they were going there very determined to uh, be heard, and they were coming with weapons. And uh, I could see that they were coming with weapons. So when I got there, I knew right away that this was going to be a very bad day. I didn't know it was going to result in this, but I knew it was going to be a very bad day because I had seen people carrying weapons and pepper spray in December in a pro protest. And so it kind of built up and no one was really watching enough. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm so glad you mentioned the point about the build-up, and you're right to identify that. And I'm glad you kept your press credentials hidden. Uh, Louis Palou, uh, amazing footage. Sad that it had to be taken. I uh, hope you do stay safe going forward. We appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for having me on. Turning back now to our look at how the attack on the Capitol unfolded. Let's look at how that attack unfolded. It's just before 2.30 p.m. on January the 6th. And the US Capitol is under violent attack, not by a foreign army or by ISIS terrorists, but by mostly white, far-right Americans, whipped into a militant frenzy by some of their leaders, including the sitting president of the United States. We must warn you that viewers may find some of the following footage disturbing. What do you need? Inside the House chamber there, chaos reigns as law enforcement tries to hold back an angry mob and find an avenue of escape for a few remaining lawmakers. Outside the Capitol, violent rioters continue to push their way through every entrance. Capitol Police and their Metro DC reinforcements are completely overwhelmed. One Capitol officer, an Air Force veteran named Brian Sicknick, is struck in the head by a fire extinguisher and later dies of his injuries. Many more officers are beaten. One of them, DC cop Mike Fanon, is completely overtaken by the crowd, which beats him and zaps him with his own taser, causing him to have a heart attack. Guys were like grabbing at my gear. I had my badge ripped off. My radio was ripped off. Um, you know, one of my ammunition magazines was stripped from my belt. And guys were trying to grab my gun and they were chanting, like, kill him with his own gun. As the rioters roam the halls of Congress, many lawmakers are escaping through the Speaker's lobby, a narrow passageway behind the House floor. It is here, just after 2.30 p.m., that the mob comes within eyesight of them through a single set of glass and wood doors. The glass is broken, and Ashley Babbitt, a 35-year-old Air Force veteran whose social media postings indicate an obsession with QAnon conspiracies, is part of an attempt to breach the window to the speaker's lobby. Abbott is killed by a single shot from the pistol of a Capitol Police lieutenant. Republican leaders now in hiding within the Capitol complex, many of whom have humored Trump's election challenges, 
have had enough. They desperately try to reach the president who is watching the siege on TV at the White House. One close presidential aide later tells reporters, quote, he was hard to reach. And you know why? Because it was live TV. He was just watching it all unfold. Lindsey Graham tries to get a message to the president by calling his daughter Ivanka, who herself has deleted a tweet referring to the rioters as American patriots. House GOP leader Kevin McCarthy gets through to Trump but finds him too distracted and reportedly even gets into a screaming match with him. So he then decides to get the president's attention by calling into Fox News. There are reports that protesters inside the Capitol are clashing with the police. Have you seen that? Have you heard that? Uh, I've watched it. Um, I cannot thank the Capitol Police enough for the job that they are having to do right now. These are people inside a U.S. Capitol. There, there are things that are happening that I probably shouldn't say right now, but this is unacceptable. House Majority Leader Democratic Congressman Steny Hoyer, in a secure location with Speaker Nancy Pelosi and also with Senator Chuck Schumer, called Republican Governor of Maryland Larry Hogan, begging for his National Guard troops. But Hogan needs Pentagon permission to move them across state lines into D.C. And it takes seemingly forever to get word back on the request. We had a little back and forth uh, trying to get that authorization. Approximately an hour and a half later, I got a call on my cell phone from the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, who gave us the authority that we needed to be able to uh, move into the city. As the shocking violence rages on and the president who set it in motion is nowhere to be found, McCarthy calls Pence and tells him to get the D.C. National Guard to the Capitol, where inside, crowds continue to mill about, invade the chamber floors, sit in lawmakers' chairs, and even rifle through their papers to determine who is with them and who is against them. Hey, look, here, look. Ted Cruz's objection to the Arizona... Cruz's objection. He was going to sell us out all along. Really? Look, objection to counting the electoral votes of the state of Arizona. Wait, no, that's a good oh, no, no, okay. okay. All right, all right, we're okay. At 4.05, President-elect Joe Biden goes on air to condemn the Capitol violence, saying it borders on sedition. He then challenges Donald Trump directly. I call on President Trump to go on national television now to fulfill his oath and defend the Constitution and demand an end to this siege. Four minutes after Biden concludes his remarks, at 4.17 p.m., Trump finally tweets his followers a rambling video message calling for peace, but also continuing to claim the election was stolen and praising the rioters as very special people. That and the arrival of National Guard troops and other reinforcements at the Capitol begins to disperse the rioters. But within hours, Twitter takes the unprecedented step of suspending the president's account. After years of lies, of bile, of incitement, Donald Trump is unable to tweet. By 5 o'clock, authorities are securing parts of the Capitol complex. Lawmakers, though, are still sheltered in place. It's then, according to one reporter sheltered with them, that Ted Cruz and other Republican objectors to the election slip away for a separate meeting to discuss whether to continue to press their electoral vote challenges. Incredibly, shamefully, many of them do continue to do just that. The Capitol has been attacked, but still more than half a dozen Republican senators and more than 100 Republican members of the House insist on voting to reject the Electoral College votes from Pennsylvania and Arizona. Nevertheless, at 3.42 a.m. on Thursday morning, after an additional eight hours of counting and debating, Mike Pence declares Joe Biden the winner of the 2020 election. But the historic, unthinkable damage to the capital and to democracy is already done. In the end, 140 police officers are injured, five people are dead. When we come back, what we've learned about the capital siege, the people behind it, how it was planned in the three weeks since.
It's perhaps the calm after the storm of the insurrection that's brought the most unsettling realities to the surface. The rioters, the domestic terrorists, as some have called them, were not just a group of random people we can easily dismiss. This was not an act born on the fringes of American society. They came from everywhere. Women like Jenna Ryan, the Dallas-based realtor, she flew to the Capitol in a private jet that she was invited on by, quote, a very cute guy she met on Facebook. Sounds so innocent until you hear her say things like this that she shared on social media. Some of her own social media posts, many now deleted, raise significant questions. We're all going to be up here. We're going to be breaking those windows. And lo and behold, she posted a photo of herself next to one. And after she was charged, said, I'm glad I did it. Breaching the Capitol was also Beverly Hills Dr. Simone Gold. Unlike the realtor, Dr. Gold, the founder of the notorious anti-vaccine group America's Frontline Doctors, now does say she regrets it. But also, well, she also said that breaking into a federal building, quote, most emphatically was not a riot. Where I was, it was incredibly peaceful. There was even a state lawmaker from West Virginia, Derek Evans, who took an oath to support the Constitution, except apparently when it comes to defending our democratic process. And in a now deleted Facebook live stream video, Evans was heard asking, where are the Proud Boys? Good question. Where were the Proud Boys? Standing back and standing by? Well, we all knew the right-wing extremist group attended the storming of the Capitol, but it's only now that it's become clear how much of a role they played in actually leading the mob into the break-in. Seven Proud Boys members, including organizer Joe Biggs, are facing multiple charges. And since the event, the group has tried to downplay its role, but a Wall Street Journal investigation that examined hundreds of videos, court filings, and even interviewed participants, concluded that the Proud Boys were actually key instigators in the Capitol riot. The Journal's investigation even found that there were ex-military men in their ranks which leads to another worrying revelation. An NPR analysis of more than 140 people charged in connection with the riot found that one in five, 20% of those who committed those acts appear to have a background in the military. Jacob Fracker is one example. The 29-year-old was off duty from his jobs as a police officer and corporal in the Virginia National Guard when he stormed the Capitol. There's another group whose involvement in the violence at the Capitol, as well as their reach within our armed forces, should truly disturb us. Federal prosecutors have charged some members of the Oath Keepers, an anti-government militia that claims tens of thousands of former and current law enforcement officials and military veterans, they claim they belong to their group. Tens of thousands of them, that's what they claim. What we've learned in the week since the attack on the Capitol is that it wasn't just a bunch of random poorly organized, overexcited MAGA types. It was far-right extremists, militias, off-duty military and law enforcement personnel. That's why come January 20th, Joe Biden's inauguration ceremony ended up looking the way it did. 25,000 National Guard troops stationed across our nation's capital, barbed wire and barricades. A green zone, in the words of the Secret Service, akin to what we call the militarized perimeter we created around central Baghdad during the Iraq war. Only these were American troops deployed to protect the American government from Americans. That's what the attack on the Capitol really revealed, how serious and wide-ranging this threat from far-right white supremacist domestic terrorism really is. And so in his inauguration speech, exactly two weeks after the attack, it was left to new President Joe Biden to face it head on, denouncing the, quote, racism, nativism, fear, demonization that inspired the assault on Capitol Hill. An assault that featured not just rioters in QAnon and neo-Nazi clothing, but also carrying Confederate flags. A cry for racial justice, some 400 years in the making, moves us. A cry that can't be any more desperate or any more clear. And now, a rise of political extremism, white supremacy, domestic terrorism, that we must confront and we will defeat. 
Our special coverage of the capital siege continues when we come back. We'll talk about a strange reluctance to charge some of the people who swarmed the capital. We'll talk to a former federal prosecutor and a former FBI agent about whether justice will ever be served. It's been three weeks since the armed and angry rioters swarmed the US Capitol in that deadly siege on January the 6th. 400 investigations have been opened, 150 have turned into criminal charges. Are there any charges of insurrection, though, or interference with a federal election? Where are the charges of obstruction of Congress or sedition? What about the killing of a police officer? So far, there are none. After Trump's mob breached barricades, shattered windows, and exchanged blows with police officers, the charges they face right now seem kind of underwhelming. In fact, the Justice Department and the FBI are apparently debating whether to charge some of the uh, people who entered the Capitol at all, who breached it. According to the Washington Post, while some prosecutors want to send a forceful message that political violence needs to be punished to the full extent of the law, other federal officials have said that people who were not engaged in threatening or violent behavior should be let off the hook. Wow. Let off the hook. Another argument is that there's just too many people to charge and it would flood the system to prosecute them all. Funny, the overwhelming rate at which black and brown people are arrested doesn't ever seem to flood the system. So why are some of the people who waged war against democracy being handled with kid gloves? Here to discuss is former federal prosecutor Cynthia Oxney, who's tried more than 50 cases and is an MSNBC contributor. Also joining us is Clint Watts, a former FBI special agent who served on the Bureau's Joint Terrorism Task Force. Thank you both for joining me. Cynthia, let me start with you. Are the January 6th attackers and rioters and trespassers, are they being undercharged in your view? What do you make of this Washington Post reporting suggesting DOJ lawyers can't decide whether or not to charge the people who were there but weren't violent to basically let them off? You know, I don't believe that. I believe the DOJ lawyers will prosecute them. I, I found th the article, whoever was the source for the article, I, I don't think they really know what the DOJ is doing. Moreover, I think that whoever is the source is sort of a wimp. I mean, the idea they would say, well, we can't really try those cases because we might lose them. No real trial lawyer would say that. There really isn't, uh, there hasn't been enough time on the seditious conspiracy to get all of the information from the FBI to go through the grand jury process. We've got a murder case that needs to be made. There are important cases and it's important to get them right. I believe everybody will be prosecuted. The United States Attorney's Office in DC has 330 lawyers. It's the largest United States Attorney's Office in the country. It not only has access to the federal courts, but the entire superior court system for the lower level unlawful Awful entry, you know, some of the lower level people can be um, siphoned off that way and make sure that they get prosecuted as well. But I don't believe uh, for one minute that everybody will not be prosecuted who's participated in this insurrection. And I do think it's very important to use this time when there isn't the impeachment trial to get the attorney general 
um, confirmed and to get this United States attorney confirmed in DC in order to make sure those decisions are done right and carefully and without pro political persuasion. Yep. That's a very good point there. Uh, Clint, these people may have been trying to assassinate the Vice President of the United States, overturn a free and fair election, and yet I'm just not seeing charges that reflect that. They haven't even caught the people yet who planted the pipe bombs. We talk so little about the fact that there were two bombs there. Today, the DHS is warning of a heightened threat from domestic extremism, which they say may persist for weeks. But did law enforcement basically fall asleep at the wheel? when it came to domestic extremism all these years, Clint? So on the first part, what I would say is in terms of the more serious charges, my estimation would be that the agents and investigators that are going after those more serious cases are actually trying to build a bigger body of evidence to make sure that they cross the threshold for a more serious crime. Remember, the first folks that they brought in there are probably the ones that are charged to the fullest. And so they're going to go through, they're going to interview everybody. They're going to try and build conspiracy cases to know who organized, who planned, who resourced, who incited. They're going to try and build all of that out. So I would not be surprised if in the coming weeks you see more serious charges. On, this, on the next part, which is, you know, looking at the domestic extremism scene, I can tell you from my own personal, you know, conversations with people in law enforcement, it has been growing all the way since uh, Barack Obama was elected president in 2008. It picked up tremendously in 2016 when President Trump came to office. And there was serious discussion about it. But at the same point, it comes down to resourcing and allocation. If you cannot designate it, if you cannot declare it, you cannot apply resources to it. This falls into the, do we call this domestic terrorism? Do we create a law around it? Part of the challenge is most of these individuals are treated as one-off crimes when they are not. They would look no different than ISIS-inspired ideological people that we would go after as a federally designated terrorist organization ideological movement. But we treat each of these as individuals. So it really comes down to agents and state and local law enforcement on their own, calling people they know and trying to figure out, hey, are these people connected together? And I think Director Ray, you know, has talked yeah. about it sometimes in Congress and said, this is our number one threat, but he doesn't have a good way to organize around it or statutes or criminal codes to organize around these groups. Yeah. Although that may be changing now under the Biden administration. Uh, Cindy, the FBI just released a seeking information poster with 10 people they say illegally entered uh, the Capitol. And of course, a lot of these people were caught and arrested and charged based on their own social media statements. They posted pictures and videos of themselves committing crimes at the Capitol. And I wonder, is that because they're just dumb? Or is it because they didn't think there'd be any legal accountability? The justice system is for Black Lives Matter protesters. It's not for people like them. Right, you're supposed to be, you're not supposed to be arresting the patriots. Did you remember what some of them were saying that? Yes, they thought that, that because it was okay with Trump, it was okay for them and they were gonna get away with it. Let, let me tell you something else about what's going on in the justice system in DC, just one little point. There are sealed indictments in the justice uh, in DC and we don't know what they are. So it may be uh, that they do have information about who planted those pipe bombs and they aren't arrested yet. We don't know, and, but I completely agree with Clint that, that they're building these cases is out with careful precision and lots of resources and it's better to get it done right than to get it done in a hurry yes um, we can only hope uh, Clint CNN is reporting today that members of Congress were left shaking their heads in disbelief after they were given a briefing about the security breakdown at the Capitol on January the 6th how bad a security failure was this? I mean, just yesterday, the Capitol Police finally apologized for the failure. Yeah, I got to say this time, it was not an intelligence failure. I've heard that kind of thrown around, you know, in some discussions. Absolutely not. It, it was not surprising to anyone that was watching this. I, I don't think for most law enforcement, we've heard that the FBI had put out bulletins. We'd heard NYPD had. This was not a surprise to them that there was this giant mobilization. It was absolutely a security failure. I mean, just comparing the preparation around the inauguration with the preparation around this event, which you could see the day before when the rallies were occurring numbered in the thousands, right? We knew this was going to happen. Look at the size of that crowd right there when you just look out at it. You could see it coming. You could see them uh, when President Trump was out there actually talking to them. I think it's interesting, the discussion you had on the block right before this about uh, Secretary McCarthy essentially 
trying to negotiate like when his authorization was going to kick in place to tell you know Governor Hogan, okay, bring in the troops. It seems like there was even preparations in the apparatus at the federal government, but no orders were issued. And it really comes down to the leadership of President Trump. It, it, it is at the White House's hands. And I think uh, when you look at some of the discussions, there was a great Vanity Fair article about what it was like to be in DOD in the final weeks up to this. They were warned and they knew and they were trying to, but they ultimately cannot do anything until they're given orders. Yeah, and we're going to have to work out why those orders weren't given or why they weren't heard or why they weren't executed. But we all saw those bizarre scenes uh, with police outnumbered, outmanned uh, by that crowd uh, three weeks ago today. Uh, shocking scenes. We hope there'll be some accountability. Cynthia Oxley and Clint Watts, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Appreciate it tonight. Three weeks ago today, three weeks ago today, we all watched those horrific scenes, the violence, the chaos, the attack on the United States Capitol. We didn't know then what we know now, how close we came to the assassination of our elected leaders. But we still do not know the full story. And in the absence of a 9-11 style national commission, we may never know. What is undeniable, however, is that the then president of the United States told his supporters to march on Congress to stop the steal, to be strong and show strength. And next month, he faces a trial in the Senate for inciting insurrection. If there is going to be any accountability for the deadliest attack on the Capitol since the War of 1812, then accountability has to start at the top. That does it for me tonight. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. live right here on Peacock. Good night.